Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Daebak Podcast, where we do a deep dive into the classic Korean dramas that have won over generations of fans across decades and around the world. Today we're discussing Coffee Prince, the 2010 drama that made Dong Yu an international star. I'm one of your hosts, Alisa, also known as Bali Newbie on Twitter, and I'm joined by Melanie of Pardesi Reviews on YouTube. Say hi, Melanie. Hey, I'm uh, Melanie, and I uh, review all sorts of Indian cinema on my YouTube channel, Pardesi Reviews. We're also joined by Vicky of Vicky's World, also on YouTube. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and Catherine of totallyfilmy.com. Hi, everyone. So I am so excited that we're all here today and getting to do this. Uh, we talk about films and shows on Twitter all day long, but it's always a joy to come in and actually speak uh, virtually face to face about these things that we love. Um, I'd like everyone to start out by uh, telling us how you got into Korean dramas in the first place. And mm -hmm. I'll start because my origin story is very simple and cliched, which is that I started watching during the pandemic shutdown and it was crash landing on you, like millions of other people who've just recently fallen in love with uh, Korean dramas. And I've just been binging them ever since. So mm -hmm. very okay. typical story. And uh, Vicky, tell me how you got into it. Uh, so my sisters used to watch them and they used to just hammer me down every time to watch them because I was more on the Indian. I just watched, you know, mainly Indian content. And so finally they wore me down and Boys of a Flower was the first one for me. Um, I just, I saw Lee Min Ho and I heard Almost Paradise and I just was <laughs> in this new world that I didn't know existed. And ever since then, it's been a journey. So it's been about a year, going on to a year and a half. And yeah, it's been interesting. Very cool. And you brought up something important, which is that all of us on this podcast started out as Indian or Bollywood movie yes. lovers first before we segued into Korean dramas. And I actually think that's also a typical path for people yeah. to find the drama. Yeah. yeah. Um, who wants to go next? Melanie? I'll go next. Um, Another uh, person, a friend of ours on Twitter who watched, who has uh, Kathy, who has the site Access Bollywood, kept telling me, she kept posting about K-pop and K-drama things, and I asked her for a suggestion. So my first one, I remember it was like fall of 2019, I saw uh, uh, Oh My Ghost or Oh My Ghostess, which was awesome, but I didn't, uh, it, the craze really started with Crash Landing on You, like everybody else. I watched it during the pandemic. Netflix was heavily serving it to us. And now if you looked at my Netflix screen, it's all either Indian content or Korean, <laughs> Korean content that it's recommending to me because it knows me so well. Um, and there's something, you know, I said that I started watching Indian films because uh, Western cinema wasn't giving me what I wanted. It wasn't giving me romantic stories. It wasn't giving me musicals. And while Korean dramas aren't musicals, the soundtracks are so uh, integral and important to to the dramas. And there, we have the female gaze. We have uh, often female centric stories, and it's always a love story. And I, uh, you know, that's what I respond to. It. And, you know, we're not the only ones, but yeah, Crash Landing on You uh, was the one that just really set off the craze for me and it's been nonstop since then. Yep. And then Catherine, who's like the OG here because she's been watching these for a while. Yeah. And for me, it's quite, it's quite funny to have seen the, my two areas of interest, which are K-dramas and Malayalam language films from the south of India and Kerala. Um, when I first started watching 
Malayalam language films, it was around 2010. And I would be out there on Twitter going, watch this film, watch this film, watch this film, like out into the void. And then watched everybody all of a sudden grab onto these films. And now it's like everywhere. And I saw the same thing happen with K-dramas. Um, I was probably the newbie around 2012 when a whole bunch of people in the Indian blogging community had, they had been watching them for a while because we had like, at that point we had drama fever had been around since what, 2007 or so. Um, and I sort of would watch people post about this and I said, okay, which one should I start with? And almost everybody said, you have to watch Arang and the Magistrate. So I said, okay. And I watched Arang and the Magistrate and I just, I fell in love and I have never looked back. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, that is the only drama I have ever purchased all the DVDs on because I thought if I can never watch this again, if it disappears from streaming, I will be sad. Um, and the two stars of that, Shin Mina and Lee Jung Gi, have been a, among my top house faves since that time as well. But it's been it's been really interesting that the number of people now talking about Crash Landing on You has been it's been phenomenal to watch that. that yeah. I think that the the shutdown has so much to do with it um, because people were suddenly home with nothing to do and binging uh, streaming content. And there's been this explosion of, you know, we, well, in the US, we would say international content industries outside of Hollywood are suddenly coming to the consciousness of the West. And yeah. it is really exciting uh, yeah. to witness that going on. Well, and, yeah. and for a while too, I mean, we lost drama fever because it got bought out and shut down. And for, and while for people who don't know, drama fever was the primary streaming service that was available to watch Korean dramas on for a while. Alongside right? Vicky.com. Alongside Vicky, which still exists, yes. Which still exists. And prior to the last couple of years, streaming services like Netflix really hadn't picked up very many dramas. So it, the, dovetailing with the pandemic, we also have suddenly these big streaming platforms picking up the dramas as well and making them even more accessible. Right, right. And, and showing also, them and showing them oh. as they air in Korea, which yeah. is the way Cra Crash Landing on You was. I mean, I kind of caught up with it, but people were watching along, uh, you know, instead of it being something that had aired and then was re-shown on Netflix, it was airing at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really interesting, though, to see this uh, because like, I've been reading about this and, of course, Korean uh, content or culture, however you want to put it, has been exported first to Asia, and this was in the early 2000s, which is part of what they call the Hayu wave, which I'm sure Catherine could speak about much more than, much better than I can. But, you know, it's sort of been this expanding universe. So it started out first going to China and uh, Japan, and then kind of working its way through Indonesia and then into India. And now if for the first time it's really hit the West with BTS, uh, you know, with Gangnam Style being a hit. So it's, I, it's really exciting to kind of like witness that, you know, as people. And it's an interesting thing too, because like Korean culture isn't necessarily all that accessible. It's weird. Like I've been, as I'm learning more about it, I'm actually, I'm both intrigued and surprised in a way that it has caught on the way it has. Because I do think there's a learning curve to like learning about tropes and cultural things with Korean mm -hmm. uh, dramas that, you know, things are like, why does that happen? Or why does this theme keep coming up over and over again? Uh, but for whatever reason, it's caught fire and, and people are really, really into it. Um, and so uh, even though I am very new to all this, I decided to start this podcast. <laughs> and, the reason, and the reason why is because... Um, I, when you're a newbie, when, when you're starting out and you go on Reddit or you go on Twitter and you go, I want to learn more about Korean dramas, what do I watch? And there are certain dramas that get recommended to you over and over and over again, right? And, um, you know, for me, the three that kept getting recommended over and over and over again were Coffee Prince, which is what we're going to be discussing today. And then um, my lovely Samsung, because Hyun Bin is in it. And he was in Crash Landing on You. 
And then the third one is Boys Over Flowers, which is just, you know, this uh, an iconic and cracked out uh, drama that gets recommended over and over again. And I started, and actually as a new viewer, I was really uh, enthralled by these older dramas in, in a way m more than the newer ones. And I started thinking about, well, what makes a classic a classic drama? You know, what is it about uh, uh, these things that makes that people fans of them over and over again, even though these are dramas that are 15 years old or older? Um, I mean, so one, anyway, that's one thing that's captivating, and we've discussed this on Twitter is that, it seems like the censorship rules are a little bit different now because they are uh, sending so much of this content to other parts of Asia, which are even more conservative than South Korea. Uh, we get much more of the fish-eyed kiss kind of situations <laughs> instead of, and so some of the older dramas can feel a little bit more passionate, which is refreshing too, if you've been watching newer content. And realer, let's just say more realistic. They exist in the real world um, in a lot of ways, uh, not just like that in terms of sex, but as in sex exists <laughs> in these dramas, uh, but also because like a lot of them were filmed on the streets and people are sweaty and, um, you know, it, it's not like now where they use the smoothing tool in post-production to make everybody look like they have flawless skin. It's just got a different, the older dramas have a really different feel than the newer ones and I kind of, and I like it. I like that kind of the raw earth feel of the older dramas. It's definitely something you get from coffee prints. I mean, part of it is that we have a heroine who's never wearing, never wearing makeup. That's right. <laughs> you know? that's right. And that's um, actually a really good segue, Melanie. I just wanted to do like a quick, uh, you know, key facts about Copy Prince, which is the drama that we're gonna be discussing today. Um, it was made in 2007. And it tells the story of Unchan, a young woman who pretends to be a man in order to get a job. And her romance with Hang Gyul, a rich young man who falls in love with her despite not knowing she's actually a woman. Um, this was a massive hit. It had ratings of about 25 to 30% of the Korean population. And it was also key to launching the Hayu wave, which I mentioned earlier. Um, in terms of being a pan-Asian hit and uh, making Gong Yu uh, a pan-Asian star. And it's, again, as I said, it's really popular today even. Um, people recommend it to you over and over and over again when you're a new viewer. And um, I just kind of wanted to give a shout out to whoever cast the show, who the casting director was. Right, because the stars of this show were amazing. You have Gong Yu, who's obviously yeah. the biggest star. Who can and, and Vicky and, and Melanie are going to take a moment to go <sighs> because <laughs> they're like the biggest Gong Yu fans ever. And I am also a, a big Gong Yu fan, but not as big as they are. He's their forever love. Um, I love him. And, <laughs> and the, right, and then you have Yu Yun An Hai, who played uh, Unchan, and she's phenomenal yeah. in it and became mm -hmm. a big star as well. Uh, Lee Sung Kyun, who appeared in Parasite yep. and has been in a lot of other dramas. My I mean, Mister. <laughs> my Mister, right? There's the big drama that he's been in recently. And then Kim Dong Wook and Kim Jae Wook, who are both uh, still working a lot. So, yeah, it was sort of somebody who had a, an eye for the up and coming talent, the people who are going to like be superstars in the future, and, you know, put them in this ensemble cast. So, um, what is it that that's special about this show? Like, what is it that? Because I think I can speak for all of us, right? Like, we all fell in love with it when we first watched it. I mean, I definitely did. I'm actually the exception because I think oh, I, mentioned, I, meant, I think I mentioned to you that I'd seen it, and I, I came to appreciate it more after watching the docu that came out last summer about it. Right, um, right. There which was I, a, which yeah. I revisited before this as well, um, and it's it it's really explores the background and and how it became very. And they didn't realize how popular it was going to be. And there's a scene in the first episode of that that the, the two docu's where where they're leaving the set for the day, and Gong Yu is standing there going, "How am I going to get home?" Because they're 
like masses of crowds waiting outside yeah. the coffee shop anyway so I, I that gave me a little more appreciation for it but I'm actually really glad now that I took the time for this to sit down and watch it all again because I saw it differently this time and I I'm actually now in the camp of yeah I would recommend this to somebody who said who would say should I watch this so I've I've come yeah. around <laughs> to it that's interesting what was it that, what was it about it that that turned you around that was special about it the second time I saw characters differently the second time around I think because I I already was familiar with the material the second time around I was sort of looking at different things and I was and and in, and I to recording this evening I was also sort of asking questions in my head about what what was interesting that was going on with it um what put me off a little bit at first a little bit is I don't really like the the man girl mistaken for a boy in any drama yeah although I did think that Yunune did an excellent job of that like really excellent because she's not I I find when that happens the, uh, the the women overact and she didn't there was no time that she did that I never felt she was, I never felt she was a man, even though she was being mistaken for one. So that was, I, despite my reservations about that plot twist, plot line, um, I really did think she did a good job. Yeah. And to piggyback of what she said, that was kind of my own sentiments in the beginning as well, because I originally watched Goblin first and then I was interested in anything going new. So then I wanted to watch Coffee Prince. But like I said, the trope was not really one of my favorites. I I, like they tend to overact and it gets annoying after a while because it's like just tell them the truth, you know. Um, But for some reason, I just could not stop watching after one episode and it just kept getting better and better. And I think that this was just really nicely. I feel like out of all the tropes that deals with this kind of storyline, I feel like Coffee Prince was just really done well. I don't know, maybe I'm just biased, but I just felt like the characters, like you said, the actors as well, just really did well. They were able to make me feel their characters. They were able to make me sympathize with them and understand why they were doing what they were doing. And so that's one thing that's very special about Coffee Prince for me in that aspect. And in the docu, the actors all talked about how much they enjoyed yes, the set. I watched that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Eason they had Kansas, great chemistry. Eason Ken says at one point, I actually wanted to come to work early early <laughs> on set early and yeah. normally I'm not like that <laughs> and I think you see that I, yeah. I think yeah. you, you see that they that they genuinely care for each other in yes. this drama and it's yeah. not just that the chemistry of the two main leads there's chemistry amongst the entire yeah. staff of the coffee friends mm-hmm. and watching the documentary you could see how they're like still best friends today yeah. you know yeah. and and how much um uh, I mean, there's, I can't remember the actor's name, but uh, her sister's boyfriend, who, you know, the big lump, <laughs> you know, he, the fact oh, that he Park died, Sun- Park yeah, Sun- that he died um, in a, in a uh, motorcycle crash, yeah. or, you know, shortly after the series uh, completed, um, it still affects them so much to yeah. this day. And I don't know, I just found the documentary, which is just a must watch yeah. Uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it it's also on vicky if nothing else to watch gong you squirm watching all the passionate scenes kissing scenes play for him yeah. <laughs> and then he's like wait a minute you're lifting up my shirt <laughs> that was in the script <laughs> i know i know and you know it was it's such an interesting thing for me because like i i got i watched this after goblin also and i didn't fall in love with gong yu and goblin i did not i know <laughs> vicky, this is like, audio i have to tell you that vicky was appalled by what i just said uh because you can't see your face i really wasn't and i got in trouble on twitter because i said i don't think gong yu is conventionally handsome and I made a few comments about his face. And I actually, I actually agree with you, but but that doesn't mean he's not attractive to yeah. me. Sure, absolutely, no, 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 no. I I was converted by Coffee Prince. Like I, 
just to make it clear, he is a sexy mofo in Copy Prince. His his yep. charisma in Copy Prince is insane. I I was blown away. I, I really was. Because like I said, a goblin left me like whatever, because I didn't like the main romance. And then I watched Copy Prince and went, holy cr- cow. And now I know why Gong Yu's a star. I mean, he just burned up the screen whenever he was on. And it wasn't just that he's sexy and... You know, it wasn't just that. Obviously, he he radiates sexual magnetism. That's what makes him a big star. But he's good in this. He's yeah. his performance. It's subtle and heart wrenching and moving. Like, um, for example, when he finally confesses to uh, Unchan, which is the big scene that everybody's like remembers, <laughs> right? It's got an, an iconic line in it about I don't care if you're a man or an alien. You know, I want to be with you. Let's take yeah. this as far as it can go. Yeah. And then, but then they both go home and he calls her and she's kind of overwhelmed in that moment and can't, wants to get off the phone. And he tells her just a minute more. And he does it, it, the, the vulnerability on his face when he says it to her, you know, he's, it's so new. It's so painfully you know, he's, he's still wrapping his brain around having confessed to her and thinking that she's a man. Um, I was just to say, rewatching it again, I appreciated anew how subtle and wonderful his performance is. I was screen capping a few scenes that I saw just even early on, they're just joking at a dinner out all of the co-workers and somebody says, he's, you know, it's, he's my Chan. And he's like, no, he's mine. And then he gets this look on his face like, did I just say that? just and and i need to have someone in my life that looks at me the way gong yu looks at her when she's eating the delight that he the smile that he gets on his face whenever she's stuffing her face i don't it just so many subtle touches where he shows us how he feels and how he loves her even before he knows it himself oh god yes and there's a point there's a point in the docu where they're watching and kim dong-uk says you know, some of these lines are really cringy. <laughs> and if it were anybody else but Gong Yu saying them, you'd be you'd be squirming at how uncomfortable yeah. it was. But he manages to sell them. He did. He yeah. did. I mean And uh, and he's playing a kind of a cliche of the Che Ball with who's a cold, but even from the very beginning, you can see the vulnerability in this character that yeah. he's kind of a lost little boy. Like he literally plays with toys. <laughs> he plays yeah. with Legos. Um, they call them block toys, but it's Legos. And so, you know, um, even when he's being kind of an ass, you know, there's always that sense of somebody in there who is actually um, vulnerable, who's actually in need of love, who feels lonely, you know, and it comes through really. And But he threads it through the whole performance and he well, made I mean, I re- the I realize everyone lied to him in his life right yeah he doesn't find out the truth about his parentage until later in the series he thinks he's his father's Ill- illegitimate child and he i guess he had run away when he found that out as a late teen or something so there's just so many people who have lied to him and then when he has the scene where he confronts Unchan, like, no, you couldn't have been lying to me for months. You know, it's kind of like, not you too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he, oh gosh, the vulnerability. I mean, I was like, I've seen this before, but I'm crying buckets again because he's just moving me so much with um, how he gives us his pain. Not, I mean, the actress is also very good. I mean, she's very good and her agony, but I think all of us would say like, there's so many moments, especially when you rewatch it, like that's when you should have told them. That's when yeah. you should. Oh my yes. God. Oh my goodness. There was, okay. So that's, I was going to bring this up later, but we should, we okay. can talk about it now about what she did and whether it was forgivable. And honestly, I'm on the side of it. it's not forgivable, really. Yeah. Like the show lets her off the hook. Oh yes. But you know, I understand like why she lied at the beginning. She's poor. She needed a job. She's the breadwinner of the family. She's lived her life uh, in a masculine role, uh, not entirely out of choice, but because her sister and her mother are completely useless and horrible people and dump all the responsibility on her to care for 
their family. So I get it at the beginning. But then when she starts to actively come on to him yeah. while in the guise of a man, yeah. like she tells yeah. him, I like you. She kisses him. Yes. You know, she's flirting with him and yep. yet not coming forward. with And seeing truth. that he's in agony about it. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, there's just so many moments. But of course, we have to have 16 or 17 episodes. So we have to <laughs> out but i kept thinking to myself as i was watching it like if this is a movie this is the moment and then you'd have the blow up and then you'd get back together but yeah it's just it's so painful yeah seeing how many times she could have come clean and be honest and i think we can yeah. all sympathize she was afraid that what would happen which did happen you know he rejected oh. her he you know fired her all of these things did happen but there was other points when they had fights and and he had left her and it's like she kept saying, I was afraid you'd leave me. Well, he did at least one other time. <laughs> and you could have told him then. <laughs> you know, and it, so here's my theory. And I think it ties into a bigger uh, theme of the, of the show, which is, you know, a woman living her life as a man, right? And that the freedom that that gives her, she's moving through the world in a way that it would be impossible for her to do if she were a woman. You know, she goes on this trip with these guys and sleeps overnight with them away, which would never have been allowed if she had been, you know, um, living yeah. as a woman. She jokes around with the guys. She gets to see uh, Harem's uh, ass tattoo. Uh, <laughs> She hangs which out he's in the a, locker. She's appalled by when he realizes she's a girl. <laughs> right, right, which is hilarious. But you know what I mean? Like she develops, she has a relationship with these guys. They treat her as an equal. She gets to joke around with them. They're not condescending to her. And so she, so, so to me, the real fear she has isn't really about um, Hangul falling out of love with her. I think it's a much bigger fear about if I come out as a woman, what do I lose? I lose a lot. I don't just lose, you know, it isn't just about do I lose this man I love? It's I lose my position that she occupies that gives her a role in society that would not be available to her. Well, I mean, looking otherwise. at it through a 2021 lens, um, are both Hangul and Unchan gender fluid? Like they didn't maybe have those labels at that time. She didn't start dressing in a tomboyish way because she was trying to get the job. That was already who she was. Right. The very first scene we see her delivering food to a women's locker room and they are kicking her out because they think that she's a boy. Everybody thinks she's a boy. Her sister calls her old pa for heaven's sake. Like even yeah. within their family, she's right. treated as a man or a boy. Um, so she was already somewhere on that spectrum anyway. And and uh, I mean, question about, you know, is the earring that Hangul is that supposed to be a, a signal to us and the kiss that he, photograph of a kiss that he had with a man when he was living in America. Is that supposed to give us any kind of clues? Oh, know, you know? well, Hangul is yeah. not straight. Can we just get yeah. it? That? I was gonna Hangul say, is not straight, okay? I, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to say that I feel like in some twisted way, they might have started off possibly wanting to make him buy or something. I feel like that was because it just, they laid the foundation for that. But I think, you know, of course, knowing the society, they didn't want to go to far with that because that made sense honestly because all that he did you know the, the kissing I mean he was definitely I so I think like I agree with you because to be really pardon pardon me for being blunt but like when he is struggling about whether or not he wants to be with Unchan right and then he comes to the decision before he knows her gender that he who wants to be with yeah. her He's he's thinking, can I wrangle a penis? Am I all right with like engaging with a man's body sexually? That's what's going on there, right? And the answer was yes. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> and, and, and and, no, but for real, let's like be real, right? And so and that's, and that's, that's and also the, pretty much the moment just after that where he finds out she's a woman. Right, oh, and, we're, and, and we're just like, 
bam. <laughs> and that's why I was actually, that's what, why I was actually really upset with Unchan also, because mm-hmm. let's say hang was actually gay. Exactly. And this was his coming out journey. He was all like, I am ready to come out. Exactly. And surprise, she's an <laughs> any, not an Audi. <laughs> and that's it. And it's like, she, he doesn't get to have that journey. Now, of course, that's not how they play it in the mm-hmm. show. But and, there and a are lot, a lot of ethical issues going on there. In a lot and of know, dramas oh. where they do this, where the with the the gender swap, it's it's a lot more. Um, there's much less physical contact. There is a little, oh, what's going on in my head, kind of stuff. But we as an audience always know that it's really a woman, and the reveal happens before you get to that point of really having to struggle with your sexuality, right. And And that's why when they talk about this show being gay friendly or like progressive on queer issues, I don't really think it is very much. Because keep in mind also, uh, I saw a film because I got into Kim Jae-wook, who's my current um, crush at the moment, (laughs) not Gong Yoo, who plays uh, 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 Sun Kim, Sun Sun Ki, Sun Ki, uh, the waffle guy in, in Coffee Prince. Two years before Coffee Prince, he did a movie where he plays a gay character who is so overwhelmingly sexy that every man he meets falls in bed with him regardless of whether they're gay or straight. The <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> it's called <laughs> Antique the, Bakery. It's really good. You should watch it. The plot this. always it's, makes me laugh. <laughs> Just and so. so, and there's like, you know, bedroom scenes with a guy where he's in bed with a guy and they're kissing and it's very passionate. And um, that's two years before Coffee Prince. So I kind of feel like Coffee Prince gets a little too much credit for being progressive. And people say, oh, well, it was the times. And I'm like, well, yeah, but in the time well, they were making that's this different because that was a movie in theaters versus well, that's true. Yeah. This is a show that whole families are watching together. Yeah, so I still think it gets over too much credit for the yeah, and to even piggyback off of what she said regarding him kind of accepting that he's possibly gay now to now knowing that she's a woman, a lot of people actually the criticism with that is they feel that it was unrealistic, um, which it's kind of in some ways makes sense because it really was kind of like a switch off you know what I mean like I feel like for him to reach that level of being like I'm ready like yes I'm gonna be with the man I'm gonna this is the life for me and then like bam you know all of a sudden he's like oh I'm so happy you're not it it was something so much deeper than that that I don't think it's it had it had to be more than that you know what I mean right and I feel like they didn't really hash it out enough it was a bit buried because it's like we never really got to okay well like you know what yeah this was on the betrayal you lied to me versus examining exactly exactly you know and and their relationship was strange don't you think i mean i think that they had a very weird relationship Uh, it didn't feel adult i mean they're literally playing with toys together yeah and they have each other in headlocks (laughs) <laughs> and they're shoving soda up each other's nose. It's very odd. Yeah. It's not a fully, I mean, the grandmother was totally right to ship her off to Italy for two years and let her grow up because they, yes. were, they were not mature enough to be married. It was like watching two 12-year-olds in a, well, in a way. She was really young, too. Uh, her she, was, yeah, she, she was really young. Yeah. She's acting like she's 17. Yeah. Yeah. Or you're yeah. younger. Right. And you really yeah. see the difference when she comes back from Italy. Yeah, yes, she, she really has matured. Yep. Yes. And, you know, so I thought, the, so the whole thing was really, it was a little odd. I mean, it's very like, you're so, how do I express this? Like the romance gets sold to you because Gong Yu is hot as hell in this, right? And his body is phenomenal and they show it off to you at every opportunity, which I appreciate very much about this show and uh, we didn't see that in goblin so (laughs) goblin didn't sell me on it but we can get into another that's a whole other discussion he didn't he didn't do anything for me in goblin sorry i was about um lee dong wook and goblin anyway um Uh, but yeah it was but so so i think that's what sells you on the romance but if you step back and like i've seen this 
show several times actually because I when I would like a show I tend to rewatch it immediately and so I've seen this three times at this point and now that I've seen it a third time it really hit me that this is a very strange relationship that they have um well i was just didn't... gonna say like you're saying that they're like kids which i will say maybe he's young for being 30 although <laughs> i have a son who's 27 who doesn't play you know <laughs> you know i think that it's it's uh they're kind of meet in the middle there let's put it that way but also one thing that i liked about it and it's not just their relationship but also lee sun gun his relationship mm there's a lot of playfulness in both relationships. And I feel like so often we see uh, relationships on screen and everything is so serious or just super romantic and weighted. And there's a lot of silly moments. There's a lot of, uh, you know, playful moments, sticking stuff up people's nose or whatever. And it's the kind of uh, joking and playing around that real relationships can have, or at least, you know, my marriage does sometimes it's silly. And so it's like, I'm like, wow, I don't often see that kind of, those kind of moments on screen. It gets a little bit much with the playing with the Lego toys. I'm not saying that my husband and I do that, but I'm just saying, uh, as far as it feeling real, that's part of what made it feel real to me, um, that we were seeing all different kind of facets of these relationships. Well, yeah. I, go ahead, Vicki. Oh, I was going to say, I feel like that was also the foundation of their relationship in the first place, because by them doing all of these things, connecting, playing and all that is kind of what really got him to feel what he felt, at least, well, that's what they were trying to sell. I mean, I felt like to me, I think he was attracted in the beginning in some odd way. He was always open to the idea of her. He... But, um, but yeah, like, like you said, I feel like that connection as well, the playing with the Lego, the, the kid, like it made him, that was something he was missing in his life. And I feel like um, Unchan kind of was that person for him. And so that was kind of the idea of he fell in love with her, you know, through that journey together of them just being buddies. And so I, I think that's probably why that had to happen in some weird Way, at least in my opinion. You know, Vicky, I think that's a really, that's really astute because um, he's a lonely kid and he talks about it a lot that he yeah. spent a lot of time. He was an only child. He was adopted. There was this really fraught relationship with his adoptive father. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, he didn't really have a child, a normal childhood. And yeah. so, you know, he's, he's engaging with Unchan in a way that is making up for this, that. Yep. And I think they even actually explicitly say that in the, in the show at some point. Well, and there's a point, the point where he decides to give up the New York job, right. um, which, I, which for me was kind of interesting because it's like, okay, I've done all the playing and I've done what my grandmother has asked. And hey, I've taken on these new challenges and new responsibilities with these new people. And I really like this. It's, it's, like, it's like he really understands finally that there's something. I mean, I, I don't want to say it's not grown up to play with Legos because I know a lot of grown ups who do and somebody has to design those things. <laughs> um, but his you know his relationship with it is playing and toys not really as this is my job even though it, he's looking at it as his job um, well, he says i learned that um with the toys i would be doing it myself yeah and i enjoyed working i found i enjoy working with other people like at the cafe and he learned so he learned that about himself that he liked working in an environment with other people whereas if he had taken that job it might have been more a uh, solo kind of endeavor. Yeah, I think definitely in the show that the, his matru maturation is definitely that movement away from the toys to a real job, like a real responsible job where people are depending on him. Like you have that lovely little moment where he pays everybody and then he doesn't pay himself and he gives everybody their envelopes full of money and he's so delighted to be able to do that. I think that's like kind of an indication of that maturation that happens in the story yeah, um, when, he, when he first takes on on the coffee shop um he you know he goes to his grandmother with this budget and she looks at him and she's like no 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 here's the budget right and he looks he looks at his grandmother and at first it's like oh, i can't work with that 
but he finds ways to do it and he finds the people to connect with to help him do it and it really is him being responsible for all of this given the constraints that she has laid out for him yeah and yeah how do you be let's creative just, let's take a moment to appreciate the grandma is she not our oh, everyone's favorite i love her Kimio she's in a lot of shows yeah i i adore her and you know what i love about this at the first time i watched it i was actually a little upset when she realizes unchun's a girl and she gets she does she does what you would expect a wealthy chapel grandmother to do and at first I was a little upset with that, but then I realized that what the show was doing, because it plays with a lot of these tropes um, and, and sets them up and you think it's going to be what you normally see and then you get something else. So the, the, his mother too is not terribly thrilled. And you, you have the scene where um, Kim Chung-wook, um, Hong Gae-shik, the, the, you know, unhygienic barista is talking to the grandmother and he says you offered her money what are you old yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I love that one <laughs> and, and, and you take a step back and you go they're calling her on this trope and the mother the mother takes some time but she makes an effort to meet Unchen and talk to her and when he goes around the family dinner and says okay who's with me um he gets his mother and she says, I think I'm halfway there. Right. It's like right. she doesn't, she starts off like, no, 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 no. And she gets to thinking about it. And that's actually another one of the things I, I really came to admire about the show is that people talk things out. They might fight like crazy and then go away and think, but then they'll come back and talk. Yeah. Or they'll call people on their business. Um, yeah. I also though like the grandmother because I think to a certain extent like she set up a challenge for Hong Yul to make the coffee shop a success um, and she wanted to kind of push him and I kind of saw her behavior towards Unchan even though it was really mean but it was a similar challenge it was like you know you're telling me you want her she's not who we want what do you mean by this but then when they pushed back and they pushed back respectfully not in a childish way, but just like standing up and saying, no, this is what we actually want. And then she was like, oh, and she came back with the offer of give her a chance to educate herself, you know? So she actually ultimately was really fair to Unchan. And when Hangyul yeah. says, you want to separate us for two years? Are you trying to break us up? And she says to her grandson, do you think I'm trying to break you up? Do you think this will do it? Like, Really? Is two years enough to do it? Like, and if it is, then you guys don't belong together, yeah. right? And, and so I, I, I actually, she was mean, but I didn't think she was gratuitously mean necessarily. I think she was, you know, she's somebody who had a purpose in what she was doing to prepare her grandson for his role as an adult and eventually to be the head of the family and the head of the business. So, in yeah. her initial reaction to finding out Unchan is is a girl is shock and she does call her a thing you know i mean she she you know wh what do you mean this thing she's not a boy or a girl you know like but it's it's more shock and then then how she comes around like you say people are talking it out and and she comes to um you know what is it mr hong you know kind of explains she's just like you she's having to be the head of her family she's having to support her mother and her sister and then that's kind of what she she realizes in offering this uh, you know internship in Italy. She's saying saying to Han Yul, "This is what she needs. She she's like me. I had to take over as the head of my family too. I you know I understand she needs to feel that she can be independent and can stand on her own feet, and not be dependent on you and your money." And I loved how the grandmother got Unchan you know better than Han Gyul did at that at that yep. moment yeah you really got that need of no I can't be dependent on your money what if you go away what if you die then what will happen to me you know so like what happened when her father left and completely changed their family's life and and at that point too she's come to the realization that she loves this industry she wants to be it and she wants to be the best 
And she's never, she says she's never had a dream before. She's only just worked to keep her family together and, and off the streets. And, and finally she has a dream. And quite honestly, that was the point where I was very impatient with Hangul because I thought, let it go, dude. <laughs> Listen to what oh, well, she's, she's saying. He's very immature. Yeah. He's very immature. I mean, yeah. you know, like if, fall, get, if we get married right now, right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, you fall in love with him because it's Gong Yu, but when you look at how the character's written, he's very, he's very childish, clearly. Especially, I actually don't want to forget to talk about the other couple in the story, because uh, you have Han Sung and Yuju. And the first time I saw this, I was like, you have this one couple who is like kittens and puppies and rainbows and they're so cute together. And then you have this other couple who's in scenes from a marriage. It's like, they're in a completely different story. And I could not understand why they were both in the story, right? And then, but now I, I think I'm starting to understand at least on some level why for, they're there for me um, for me they're part of what the drama does in terms of setting up lots of parallels so and you have lots of love triangles as well that you right. look, that you're looking at from different angles so you see all these relationships going on and you get to you get to compare the different that's why that's why when i hit the the trot song the twist of love i realized that the, the crew at Coffee Prince are always humming or singing this song when they're working. And this is this is what all these relationships are. They're like people on a dance floor doing a twist and trying to, you know, dance together. Well, I thought it was, what I thought was really interesting about Yuju, who is hated, by the way, online. Like if you read about Coffee Prince, people always say, hate Yuju, hate you. I'm a Yuju defender. I really like her. I um, hated her the I, first time I watched this. And I loved her the second time I watched yeah. her. She, I well, for one thing, I I didn't realize it until this watch that she is also a woman living like a man, but she weaponizes her femininity to give herself the freedom to move through the world the way men do. She sleeps around. She cheats on her boyfriend. She has this career that it's an international career. She gets up and moves to another country whenever she wants to on the uh, on a whim. She doesn't answer to anybody for her life. So even though outwardly she's very feminine, she's really very much like Unchan on another level. And it's not an accident that both men fall in love with both yeah. women, mm -hmm. right? And it says a lot about those men that they fall in love with the women who do not conform to traditional femininity mm -hmm. in various ways. Yes. And and then, to Sorry. Go ahead, Vicky. No, no, I was going to say you made a good point when you said about um, Unju regarding her being feminine on the outside, but masculine a bit on the inside. I felt like that was in contrast to Unchan, who was masculine on the outside, but feminine on the inside in some aspects. And so if you bring up the, the fact that both men ended up liking Unchan, they were definitely attracted to her because of that feminist she's not you know even though she had that masculinity she was still very much feminine in some aspects and so Unju was you know she was different and so that's kind of what made it you know they like you said they're not men don't really like when women are kind of they don't conform to what they think a woman should be um and so that, that i just thought about that like in some ways that's probably why they were attracted to john both of them um, well, and, and both of them level. were attracted to yuju too i mean hung yeah, on her <laughs> so they're both alike in that respect that they're cousins and they both are going for women who don't fit in yeah some way, you know who aren't conformists um and another thing I really liked about Yuju is she never, um, she was always uh, kind to Unchan and spoke up for her. Mm -hmm. And yeah. she was jealous of her. She was threatened by her, but she never took it out on her. Yeah. And I really liked that about Yuju. Yuju punched up, not down. She punched at the men, but she never punched at, Unchan, because she recognized that Unchan was like a kindred spirit. Like I think mm -hmm. she kind of understood Unchan, and um, 
you know, like for example, when they're trying to get granny on board with the marriage, Yuju speaks up for her. Uh, she doesn't have to, you know, um, even when she's afraid that she's going to lose Hansung to Unchan, she doesn't like attack her or put her down or anything. Yeah. Yeah. And let me just say that was actually very refreshing to see because a lot of K-dramas nowadays will have that evil second lead female who's just so ridiculously <laughs> uh, and it's just really annoying but you see the difference in this drama you know you see a different second lead female who's much much refreshing um and not crazy and mean i like yeah. the scene late in the in the drama where the two cousins you know han Gyul is saying how did you put up with me crushing on your girlfriend for nine yeah. years? Basically, like, just are you just give me a punch, you know? Like, because once he had it on the other foot and he was jealous um, of the relationship that his cousin had with Unchan, then he's like, How did you put up with this? You know, like, and I'm seriously, like, nine years. I mean, a little bit, I, I was aggravated with Yuju just because. It seemed like she toyed with Han Gyul a little bit, you know. I mean, oh, she yeah. that he was at her beck and call, you know. You know, whenever, and and so she just kind of toyed with him. So I don't have hatred for her, like, but I'm just saying, she did kind of string him along for all of this oh, time. Yeah, yeah. You know? in the beginning, I was definitely like, okay, <laughs> you're getting annoyed. So after I watched it a second time, like I, I feel like that's when I understood the sentiments. But oh yeah, for sure, I was definitely annoyed with her. I mean, she's manipulative. Yeah, she manip- but she manipulates the men, and yeah. in the society, the men have the power. Mm-hmm. So her, her power, her ability to seize her power and operate in the world in a different way is dependent on her ability to manipulate these men, right? And to play on her sexual attractiveness. So, like, is she like a nice person? No, like she actually says it in the drama that she's yes, not a nice. Yes. Person. <laughs> uh, but I like her a lot as a character. I wouldn't necessarily want her in like real life as my friend. Maybe, maybe I would. I mean, she was really nice to Unchan. Maybe I would want her as my friend. I don't know. But she, uh, but I thought she was fat. I thought she, I thought she was fascinating, and I definitely you know, appreciated the role she was playing in the drama. Well, because both, men and then, sorry, go ahead. Both Yuju and Unchan know who they are fundamentally. Yes. And they accept what's good and bad about themselves. Right. Right. And I think, yeah, like they're both, and I found that refreshing too. Like Yuju yeah. doesn't, is not self-deluded about who she is. I think Unchan a little more conflicted about it. Like, I think Unchan definitely feels that pressure to, like, when she, oh, so, um, oh, God, I just seen, so when she lets Hansung dress her up. Yeah, I was just going to talk about that. Yeah. Oh, he, and the thing is, he's awful. Like, however awful you think you Drew is or whatever, but Hansung deserves everything he gets from her because he was really manipulative towards Unchan, I think, and used her and um, to kind of took advantage of her vulnerability in a way that Han Gil never does. So Han Sung is a really problematic character in terms of how he treats her. And he's not loyal to his cousin. He's never looking out for Han Gil, right? No. I mean, he's not, he never thinks about him first or thinks, hey, you know, maybe I should be pushing Unchan harder to tell him. Um, you know, it served his purposes to have her only out to him and not to his cousin because then he could work on her without competition i mean it's really <laughs> messed up no i'm serious yeah. it's no 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 he, really he's gross <laughs> and i, mean, I love Lee Sung kyung like it's the sexiest i've ever seen him in anything he's hot in this but um but the character is kind of kind of gross yeah and you know you don't realize that until you kind of like watch it again you're like hmm, okay because in the beginning, when I watched it the first time, I was like, oh, okay, okay, cool, cool. He's a cool guy. He's more accepting of her. But then I thought about it like, wait, he definitely has a girlfriend. He's definitely, like, he knows. And, like, he knows after he knew his cousin also was interested. It was just kind of, yeah, I get what you mean. I get what you mean completely. It was it was definitely offsetting as a character. Um, well, and the first time when when Yuju comes back and she's trying to get back together with him, first he puts her off, and then they go to bed, 
and he's yeah. very blunt that he did it to get back at her yeah yeah mm-hmm. it's like really <laughs> yeah yeah they deserve yeah. each other <laughs> they do uh, listen they're perfect for each other i <laughs> I know. And then, you know, you could just see them getting divorced in five years. Ugh. Honestly, I didn't think that they should have been together at the end. I thought that they had many issues as a couple that was just a bit toxic for them, at least in my opinion. I, they were just, I think they needed separation for good. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I think the drama wanted to wrap it up, you know, because they wanted everybody to have a happy ending. Yeah. But I really didn't think that they were all that crazy about each other like they claimed they were at the end. Because all the crappy things they did in that relationship, I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't, I don't think. They but did. then they would be inflicting themselves on other people. So it's yeah. better for them to be together. I mean, hey, <laughs> <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> that way. Um so I also just wanted to take uh, a minute, more than a minute, to talk about the other princes because um, the ensemble of the people who work at the Coffee Prince Cafe, I think, is a really big part of why this show was so popular. Um, you could compare it to Boys Over Flowers in that regard, where you have like a cast of really hot guys. And like, you know, you could just imagine teenage girls going, oh, I love Harim. Oh, I love Sunki. Oh, I love, you know, Minya. Yeah, they all use one for everybody and you can like pick one. Um, so I thought, but I thought those characters, on the one hand, it's really fun to see them uh, in, the, in the coffee shop together. On the other hand, I felt like those, they were a little underdeveloped, that, that, that the, their stories could have been better developed. And it would have helped the storyline because I actually thought that the story was a little thin towards the end of the drama. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if there had been more development of those characters, it would have helped with that. Yeah, they definitely stretched out the whole Inchon and uh, Hanji. Like, yeah. Thing. yeah. And yeah. poor Minyup with, with Inchon's sister. Oh, oh. oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Awful. He, he went, oh, God. <laughs> Unchan has like, the worst family ever. They're horrible, horrible people. Goodness. Like he's such a sweet puppy. <laughs> like he is a sweet puppy. And she and she's so terrible to him. My oh. favorite scene with him is when he rampages with the refrigerator. That was <laughs> so funny. Oh, uh, it's so brilliant. And he's just like charging up and down the street. Um he was such a oh, I'm not gonna lie, when I found out that he had passed away, it was a little too oh. close. I was really hurt. Um a little bit yeah 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 he was on he was really on the cusp of something yeah uh, yeah you know mm-hmm. and he just like you said he was just so sweet and and this lovable lug <laughs> like, yeah and watching yeah. the documentary and i you know that little segment of this gong you and them talking about him it was just oh. and all of them like practically weeping yeah mm-hmm. like you know, i was i was teary i was yeah. teared up because it just God. yeah it was so sudden it's sad he couldn't but, even i feel like feel the wave of coffee prints you know right right he didn't even get the full impact yeah. of it mm-hmm. um you know because like the other actors i think are still they're best known for it oh, i mean yeah. i think yeah <laughs> a lot of them yeah, yeah. Prince is definitely their highlight for sure though. um kim kim dong Dong-wook. Dong-wook, uh, <clears throat> I, he does not get enough work Oh he my is. god, I, li- I like him. He's like him. he is a terrific yeah. actor. Have you seen Silent? Have you seen his other drama, Find Me Your Member? I I yeah I I love him in that. Um, what's the actress's name? Mungaya. Yeah, I I felt for me she was terribly miscast. I think she's too young for the role. Yeah, she was young. And I kept thinking it's the same kind of role that uh, you and uh, you and I did in. Um, I'm oh, having right. a, I'm having a brain lapse with um with Lee Dong Wook. Oh, plays, are you talking about my um? I know which I know what you're she talking about. The, she plays touch, the she plays the touch my heart. Touch yes, my touch heart. Heart. and she yeah. plays yeah. this dippy heart. actress, and yeah. she does it brilliantly. And I yeah. was thinking it was that it was supposed to be that kind of role, and it just there was no chemistry, and it was just. But he was terrific. 
Oh yeah, the, he's really good. He did yeah. great as a newscaster. I mean, I was very impressed when I watched. Him. Yeah. I was like, oh wow. Well, I really want to see him in the guest, uh, except that it's a scary, <laughs> it's terrifying, and I'm having trouble getting through it. But he's, I only I watched the first episode. He's really good in it. It's a horror yeah, show. Yeah. And actually, oh, okay. Kim J. Wilk is in it too, yeah. uh, playing oh, a priest. I, I love Kim. He J. looks really good dressed as a priest. He looks good in a lot of things. <laughs> oh my God. So <laughs> I. <laughs> He's so hot. I was I saw her yeah. private life and oh I've been starry oh eyed ever since. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ryan Gold. <laughs> Ryan Gold. Ryan Gold. Ryan. Oh. Oh, I love man. him and his suits and his little pants. Ah, oh, he was he's he but he's also a really good actor which he doesn't is. really come through in coffee prints weirdly enough. Like yeah. when I saw him in coffee prints the first time, I didn't think his performance was anything other than wow that boy is really yeah. gorgeous and other yeah. than that there's really not much there but now I've seen a few more things with him and he's actually quite talented so I don't know what happened in that maybe the ensemble just overwhelmed him or his part was underwritten or something or other I uh, do I do think his part was underwritten yeah. and the last episode suddenly tries to give all the coffee boys a happy ending yeah and it just happens so fast that you you kind of go wait what yeah so it yeah. would have been, well, yeah. been nice to spend a little more time on each of them, but I mean, I came to appreciate Kim Jong Un, who's Mister Mister Hong, except for him eating his own snot. Like, what the hell with those scenes? Like, oh my god! I could not stand that character. I had to re. I had to fast forward through everything with him in it. It was making well, me ill. I couldn't deal with it. It was I, disgusting. I I did like his no nonsense uh, relationship with the grandmother, though. Like how he called her on her crap, and just was like, like, like the uh, what are you old? You offered her mo- unchun money, <laughs> you know, like that kind of stuff. But well, and my comment about him is he's like unchun, and that his appearance is really deceptive. Like you, like he's really unhygienic and gross, and yet he is this talented coffee roaster barista guy um and you have to get past the fact that he's really not terribly he's kind of icky (laughs) um and there's a point there's a point about around sorry around episode 11 or something where the where they're ending a scene and it goes to one of those light boards outside the shop and they have drawn images of all the coffee boys and the two managers and his image is one of him picking his nose yes (laughs) yes. Can't get. I couldn't get past the fact that he was preparing food. Oh okay. God! I sorry. That's where they. I, and the thing is, like, there's a lot of gross out humor in in Korean dramas, especially the older ones, and that's been an adjustment for me. And toilet humor, and that's been, definitely been like a hurdle for me to get past because it well, grosses me out. Speaking of food, I thought one of the funniest things in the documentary was the fact that Gongyu was commenting like, oh, look, her face is a little skinny there. That's oh, before she had to do all the eating on screen because yeah. you just think about how many scenes she's stuffing her face and trying to just like, because it's like, she, you know, it's like I have an opportunity to eat. I'm just going to shovel it all in before, you know, somebody else grabs it. Um, <laughs> like there's, but there's so it gets, many. It gets played for laughs, but it's not really funny because it's like, she's starving she's starving because the family's so poor and they're struggling so hard and she's doing these really physical jobs that require her to like you know ride her bicycle all over the place in the middle of in early hours of the morning and uh yeah so it's like they they have a scene where they throw uh pork on the floor and she eats it off the floor yeah yeah and, and they call that in chun-esque or something yeah in chun like or chun-esque um but <laughs> you know underneath that is like that she's she's so poor and struggling it is something that comes up a lot in the story that I actually did like though the idea that you know what what is being poor do to you what what do you have to do and you you talked about this a little bit Catherine before the podcast about the candy stereotype so I think you wanted to touch on that a little bit yeah and I think it's another example of what this drama does in taking those kind of tropes and and playing with them because the whole candy thing is is the theme it, it's from a japanese um manga um and it's a poor pretty girl who works a bazillion part-time jobs 
she, you know, she's, she's really struggling to make ends meet. Um, and she, all the, the rich boys fall in love with her. Um, and there's another drama. Um, I think it's well, that's boys over flowers and so many, so many other ones, right? Well, oh. there's, yeah. And there's also master's son where it's another, you know, sort of poor girl, rich boy. And that character actually says, what do you think? I'm some kind of candy. So it, it's not that, that coffee prince is the only drama that tries to turn this on its head, but it's, it's rare enough that it makes it interesting when they take that trope and you go, yeah, she's poor. She's perky. She's cheerful. She works like stink and yeah, the rich boys in love with her, but she doesn't want him to rescue her, which is usually what happens in the candy trope. She, the, the poor girl gets, gets rescued. So I thought that was, for me, I really liked that, again, another example of the kind of things they do to take a trope and, and think you're getting that. And then, no, wait, look, we've done something much more interesting with this. But or, just, like, or just lighter moments like that Han Gil can't hold his liquor. And so you always see the piggyback yeah. scene. Well, she's the one that's carrying him because he can't hold his liquor. So she has to cart him home or cart her, cart him to her Taekwondo studio because she can't carry him all the way home. So, uh, you know, I, I love, there was just little moments like that that got turned on, on their head. Yep. To understand. So I guess my final question will be like, do you think this is a deserving classic? Do you think this is something that has, you know, that, people today should be checking out like if you're brand new to korean dramas is this a must see definitely yeah i would i would agree and and this is this is from coming from the perspective of not loving it from the first watch and now really appreciating what it does Uh, the only the only thing i would say is i think it it's it does it's helpful it does does. to (laughs) have seen (laughs) some of these tropes first maybe but then that's like that's like the om shanti om question should you recommend om shanti om to a beginner or do they need to understand more about bollywood and i think in in some ways i think people will come to yeah and however you know like i do not like boys over flowers but so many people that's their first drama and that's what gets them hooked and for me it's like if you're if this is how this is your gateway then this is your gateway and if you love it that's fine god (laughs) <laughs> and you'll you'll come to understand and maybe you'll vi- revisit coffee prince after you watch 10 or 15 or 20 more dramas and you'll see more in it so it's it's definitely got stuff there for people to find and it has gone you <laughs> and it has gone you yeah that's all you need to say right there i mean to me it's savoring the performances because i do think it's one of it may be Gong Yu's best performance. And um, I mean, I haven't seen all of his movies, but I'm just saying from the dramas that I've seen. And it was interesting. He was on a recent talk show uh, promoting his upcoming movie. And he was he was talking about how whenever it's summer, he thinks about Coffee Prince. And whenever it's winter, he thinks about Goblin because these two dramas were so important in his career. And it's weird for me to think, but he said he was burned out and really questioning if he wanted to continue on as an actor when he got Coffee Prince. She was a key and that yeah. the love and she got of a lot doing of it Let and how much joy. Yeah. I mean, you can see the joy on the screen of all of them working together. Um, how much he enjoyed doing this particular drama reinvigorated him into doing his career. I also love that his mother gives him the business because she said, why can't you treat me as nicely as you treat the mother and the grandmother and coffee print? (laughs) That's hilarious. He has such a sweet relationship with them. And uh, I guess he's not quite as affectionate as home at home. I don't know, but I thought that was funny. (laughs) And I really want to, I really want to hammer home what a job Yoon Hae did in this drama. And she talks about it a little bit in the, in the docu about coming from, because she was, she was a, uh, an idol star. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in some ways you can understand why, because, and I, and I mentioned to you, Alyssa, um, the, um, 
uh, there's a there was a series of skits on on the program gag concert which is a kbs comedy program and it was around setting up like a drama and you'd have all these stock characters and at one point in comes the idol star and the idol star literally reads everything from the script including the stage instructions so there is that kind of um feeling about idol stars sometimes merited and you know they put they put them in a drama because it will get people watching but sometimes they're not quite up to it and it's really unfair for those who are up to it or who could be up to it because the drama she did previous a print was it princess hours she's not wonderful in that but you can see how much she wanted to play gonchan and how much work she put into it and how much emotion she put into it. And I really think that like, alongside Gong Yu, that really she needs a lot of accolades for what she did in that, in that drama. Yeah, I agree. I, we kind of gave her short shrift because we were too busy fangirling the boys, but she, her, she had to thread the needle of being convincingly boyish and yet appealing enough that it's plausible that uh, Gong Yu would fall in love with her and she absolutely nails it. Um, uh, it's really, really well done. Uh, just the way she walks and moves through space and holds her body and so forth. It's, it's yeah. It's and a she great never moment. lets go of that thread. No, no. And she doesn't girl it up after the reveal. So, which is another thing, um, which is probably a directorial choice, not her choice, but it's still, it's, it's really great that even after they were openly, uh, romancing each other that she's still, still the same Unchan, which is great. Well, and when she comes back from Italy, she's slightly more fem- feminine. Tiny yeah. bit. Yeah. A tiny bit. But you yeah, still- plausibly. You plausibly. Still, yeah. And you still, for someone who's matured in a couple of years, but right, she's, right. you still sort of feel the core of Unchan there. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, because she, she still has that teasing, you know, of, of Gong Yu and, and everything. Um, but right, like her hair is a little curled. Um, she's wearing a polo shirt, but it's a more feminine polo shirt. And she's wearing tight jeans and not her, uh, she's wearing skinny jeans and not her normal crap, you know, boy shorts. Uh, right, so right. or crap, you know, crap jeans or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a progression. It's not, it's not like Sabrina coming back all glammed up or something, you know, right, from the movie. Right, so right. Uh, she, she did a fantastic job. I don't know how many people are watching Mr. Queen right now, which is yeah, completely playing this gender bender thing in a very, uh, you know, very out there comedic, loud kind of performance kind of a way. Uh, and, and that's not what this performance is. It's, it's so nuanced. It's, um, you know, I mean, she feels like a real girl. She feels like a real tomboy girl. And, um, you know, that's the thing. All of these characters feel so, so real. And the, and the show does have such rewatchability. Like I, I, I was watching those scenes just last night of when um, Hang Gyo finds out that she's actually a girl and feels so betrayed. And I mean, the tears were just flowing again for me because I was, it's partially just the way his performance is so good. But I mean, it, I mean, that's, I think a real sign when you just can be so moved, even though you know what's going to happen, you know what the ending is going to be, all of that. But the moment the watching it and you're just still swept up in the drama and you're swept up in their emotions and the tears are just flowing and flowing and flowing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's that's how I feel about Coffee Prince. And to be honest, I think a lot of the older dramas that I've watched so far kind of gives me this nostalgic feel. I don't know. It's something about them that it's like it's a warm feeling even though i haven't experienced you know the storyline or the plot it's just i think it's just something about the characters or the setting or just how it's made for some reason it definitely makes me nostalgic and just think about life and think about maybe one day i want to go to a coffee shop like it makes you just you want that family kind of chemistry like that they had in the story and so when I do recommend it to people, I do let them know that, hey, this is what you're getting yourself into, because not a lot of people are as open-minded, you know, some people like certain stories. So I think that that's one of the dramas that I only recommend after somebody has 
either seen something with Gong Yu and they like him, so they're gonna accept it, <laughs> or or you know they're very open minded because some people don't like that trope. No matter what, I mean, I have a sister who doesn't like that trope. Like they just don't really connect with it, and if they don't give it a chance, they won't know what a gem it is. You know, so I I it's one of those things that I recommend after maybe a couple a while after the person is has been into Katie dramas for a bit yeah yeah it's interesting because I watched this pretty well I mean I've only been watching Katie dramas but last you're, year you're pretty much open-minded <laughs> I am very different. open-minded different. Just, okay. <laughs> I'm different no but I mean I think though for me like what sells this for me first watch was the romance because of Gong Yu and I fell in love with Gong Yu like everybody else falls in love with him when you watch mm-hmm. it for the first time. But then on the rewatches, it's for me, it was about the camaraderie of the boys in the coffee shop and feeling like you could walk out your door and if you were in Seoul, you could stroll down there and they'd be there cleaning the... the- <laughs> yeah it totally feels like that it's totally like i hung out there in college yeah. and knew all those guys and they were great and um if and i love that it's filmed on the streets of seoul i love that people are sweaty i love that people have visible acne i mean i know that sounds weird but like i just they feel like real people no, that you could actually know right mm-hmm. instead of like today i like a lot of the dramas today but they're hyper real they're They're, not they're not yeah (laughs) no no when people's skin is levitating off their face because of the smudge tool that they used in post-processing uh yeah i I don't like that literally no pores you see no pores no pores (laughs) in including people you've seen in the older dramas and you know they have pores and then you see them with no pores and it gets silly so that's this is like why I wanted to do this series because I do think like these older dramas definitely have spoken to me more than the more recent one, which is weird yeah. because I'm brand new to all this. And yeah. yet I find that the older ones are more, I don't know, they just hit me emotionally. Much I cannot more. wait for Boys Over Fire. <laughs> Boys Over Fire is going to be hilarious. Like so it. just for a preview for the people who are listening, this is part of a series we're going to be covering uh boys over flowers we're gonna be covering um my I lovely love sam soon we're also gonna be talking about what we think are gonna be the future classics that are like the must watches and including my mister um and we're just gonna talk about why why we like all the you know what makes a classic a classic in these stories so we have a lot of fun ahead in future episodes um this was wonderful I'm so glad we got a chance to talk and, and do this. It was wonderful. Um, I just wanted to give everybody an opportunity to let folks know where they can find you online. And we can start with Melanie. You can find me on YouTube. Uh, my YouTube channel is called Per Daisy Reviews, but I don't talk about K-dramas there. I talk about Indian cinema. And uh, you can find me on Twitter um, at Movie Maven Gal. That's where I post all my gang you love. <laughs> And Vicky, where can people find okay. you? Uh, my username is that Vicky girl. The so Vicky is spelled V I C K E Y girl. Um, I'm on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter with the same name. Uh, just like uh, Melanie, I do do I do, do I do Indian content, but I also do K dramas, K pops. I mix it up a little bit because I just can't stop with one thing in life. Um, and same i talk about it on twitter k-pop mostly on twitter so find me add me yay <laughs> <laughs> and Catherine, and uh, for me um in indian movie reviews at totallyfilmy.com and i'm on twitter at k matthews which is k-a-y-m-a-t-t-h-e-w-s and you can find me on twitter at bollywood newbie at symbol bollywood newbie but we also have a Twitter account for our podcast and you can find us there at Daybok one podcast or Daybok project. Wait, <laughs> I just said that. I don't remember. I'm embarrassed. Hold on. We're going to look real quick so I can give you guys the correct thing here. Um, hang on. Daybok podcast one. Okay. 
Debak. So Debak. Sorry. Debak. Still learning Debak. Debak. I can't, I can barely pronounce Hindi and now I have to learn to pronounce <laughs> Korean. Anyway. But you know what's um, funny is that I found that a lot of Korean words get stuck in my head more than Hindi words do, which oh. is really weird in some weird way. I'm, I don't know how my brain works. But <laughs> oh, it's opposite oh, for me. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. A lot of phrases from gay dramas have gotten stuck in my head. I can't even. I go. I go. I go. Yeah. 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 Which means hungry. Like, there's just so many phrases that I. So, anyway, ladies, thank you so much. And listeners, thank you for joining us. And stay tuned for our next episode. Take care. Bye.